I too just have to revert to the tracker mortgage um, situation to start out with um, because what I'm finding from customers isn't uh, in, in what we're being told here. Um, when is the next update going to be um, on the tracker mortgage situation? Because customers are ringing the central bank and they're being told that there's no date for the next update. So maybe you just clarify that first. The goal is to have a final report before the end of the year. So we do think, uh, you know, I say there may be some cases going into early 2019, but by and large, as we said, four of the banks are, are nearly at the finish line. There's one bank with still distance to go, but we, we do intend to have another report at the end of this year. But might I add that each bank who is responsible for communication with their own customers um, are required to have um, information and communication channels with those customers. So where customers uh, want an update on their particular case, they need to be speaking to their banks and we've been yes. in contact with them about ensuring that they are uh, placed to provide that information to their customers. Okay. And therein the problem lies because they're not communicating with their customers. And the customers are being bounced from their own bank to the central bank to the ombudsman and back again. So, I, let me, uh, so where you have information about yeah. that happening, I would welcome it because we act on all uh, types of information. Our clear expectation has been communicated to each lender um, uh, about having information available for their customers. And um, so too we have been in contact with the Ombudsman about being clear um, about the process and information for customers. So if you have a particular specific uh, issue to address with where that isn't working, we welcome that information and we have been acting on that because the information for customers will be available through each specific lender. The Central Bank of Ireland would not be able to advise on an individual case-by-case -case basis we would never be able no, to advise on that basis. and I completely understand that. But could customers who have been three years within this process since it was started out are absolutely at their wits' end in not being answered? The most basic questions. I'll, I'll just give you one of the questions. Even you know, on a tracker uh, for months in 2007, then on to a fixed rate. The bank says they decided to go on the fixed rate, so nothing. It's nothing to do with us. Um, you know. Very basic things that the answers should already be established to. There shouldn't be any ambiguity about these cases. Other cases around the interest rates and what the interest rates were at the time. You know, a letter saying that the tracker averaged 7.9 percent when that clear when that interest rate clearly wasn't right. So it, they're still not. And what the banks are doing, and you need to know this because what the banks are telling the consumers, it's the central bank lack of decision making that's holding things up. I mean, statistically, so that's how they're communicating. The what we have is 93% uh, of the overall paid out, so there's a, a few thousand left. So there's two scenarios. It's either one of these cases is in the few thousand we know about and which are still in this final process of verification, or it's a situation where it's, it's someone who has questions about uh, his or her mortgage but which are deemed to be outside the examination. And I'm wondering if this is part of uh, some of the non-communication is uh, people who, are, who the banks have not included, they've decided these are not part of the uh, group that needs to be redressed and compensated. Um, oh, but they still was, deserve a basic uh, degree of, uh, of uh, communication from their banks. So yeah. we've had specific conversations with each bank about precisely these scenarios. They are fully aware of our views with respect to um, all areas of this work and they have been very clearly told by us to get on with communicating precisely the situation to all of the customers. We have been very clear with the Financial Services Ombuds, who is in entire agreement with us, that any cases that are to be progressed, um, there is no impediment at all to communicating effectively with people to tell them whether they're in scope, outside of scope, uh, what their options are and to get on with progress their cases. We were at great pains uh, to make sure that that whole system of um, 
options for people was working and there was nothing in the way of that working and we have been very clear in communicating our expectations to each lender so where that in fact is not translating into their actions for customers it's very important that we have any specific information because that's entirely contrary to our expectation and our communications on that have been unavoidably clear. Yeah, because so what appears to be happening is then when people are getting onto the central bank, they're being referred on to the ombudsman. So that's the circle that continues on. How do you make sure that the communication between the banks and the customers is uh, timely and accurate? As I've said, we have set our expectations for uh, the communications that the banks need to have in place. Um, and the central bank wouldn't, if people ring us, of course, we'll seek to help them with general information. But how but do you check that the banks are doing what you're telling them to do? So, I mean, that, that's basically part of our inspections regime. We have inspectors uh, going into the banks, uh, following up on all sorts of issues. So, it, basically, how we check on a bank about whether they are following through on uh, what we require of them is uh, through our a range of uh, interventions. So there's many, I mean, we have a large staff of supervisors who are there to really uh, be engaging with the individual banks. Uh, but they, they typically, um, uh, this is on the basis of, so sometimes there's kind of a, you know, if you like, you're going in and you might find something that you've, uh, you uncovered through some check. Other times you've got some information from a maybe from a member of the Oireachtas, okay. maybe some yeah. other way. Okay. But we do act, I mean, let me emphasise again, when you, when you do communicate with us, when there's something specific, we do follow up and we do make inquiries. Okay. And equally, if anyone, any customer uh, makes contact with us with specific information, as in uh, uh, we, can, we can follow up. So absolutely, we do follow up. And this is why I would take a very dim view of any bank, which is... Um, essentially misleading customers mm. uh, through their communication. Okay. How many inspectors do you have? Um, and how often do they, I just want to get a picture on how often do they go out to the bank to check all of these things? So there's a, there's a, a range of inspection teams that operate uh, a, a, across the bank. Um, so in terms of banking supervision from a prudential perspective today, they're about in and around 45. Um, there'll be sub, uh, sub supplementary uh, other inspectors working out of consumer protection we've also uh, dedicated additional resources to going into the banks because of this um, the nature of the tracker mortgage examination and the, and and the need to, 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 to go into the institutions and make sure they are uh, delivering as 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 we expect that's also been supplemented by third party uh, checks both um, commissioned by the uh, by the banks under our instruction and also third party checks that we do ourselves so it's difficult to have a kind of precise number it is mm. scores um, of, of inspections that we uh, mm. uh, uh, full time equivalents that are that are in banks on a, on a regular basis so you have scores of inspectors and they're not picking up the the, the communications that we're getting and the consumers for here. Uh, as, as, the, as the Governor has mm. said, if there is information that you have that you can share with yeah. us, that, that we will I'm, absolutely follow up yeah. and we will absolutely make sure that we're, we're, that, that yeah. we're looking to it and other banks are delivering I'd, as we expect I'd them to. I certainly do that. You refer to enforcement action. Um, could you maybe just spell that out for me, what the enforcement action would be? Sure. Um, maybe I'll ask Derville. So there are six open enforcement investigations in respect of the tracker mortgage um, issues. It is looking at the conduct of the business and any persons whose issues arose to acquire evidence uh, to see if any rules were broken and what is the evidence supporting that. They are looking at the conduct of the institution and the conduct of, uh, it would be, the senior persons who are in place at the time taking those decisions. They also are scrutinising the conduct of the tracker mortgage examination as the examination played out in the uh, business. Um, you heard about that earlier, so the behaviour with respect to how they behaved in the examination, uh, redress and compensation behaviours, uh, behaviours with yeah. respect okay. to um, causation uh, and other matters, and all of the different regulatory frameworks mm. are being considered and the evidence is being acquired mm. and scrutinised um, from emails, uh, minutes of meetings, interviews with employees yeah. so and staff. Happens, okay, so, so okay, what happens at the end of that in terms of the enforcement? 
what are what are your choices again in terms of what sanctions are available to you? So there's a range of options that uh, could be taken into account in um, the whole range of options could be that where there's evidence uh, that the rules have been broken, um, one would have to consider all the relevant options. Uh, one of the main tools that the central bank has is the administrative sanctions procedure, uh, where a case would be referred to um, a panel to adjudicate upon the matter uh, and see if the case was proved in the, in the way of a court case. And then the options that would be available to them um, would be options from fines to disqualifications of individuals where the rules have been deemed to be broken in accordance with the way that those rules are written, that, that individuals participated in wrong conduct. Okay, and, and that includes custodial sentences? Separately, where there are mm. evidence of criminal offences, mm. uh, the central bank would have an obligation to report those to the criminal authorities who would adjudicate on those matters and bring cases forward. And th though, depending on what those those offences were, if there was evidence of them, that would follow the court procedure and whatever penalties the court uh, system has adjudicated upon as being appropriate for those offences. Have you reported any, as it is now, as criminal? Um, the, I, the, the central bank keeps that under review at all times. But you haven't actually reported any cases as it is. But certainly we have been in dialogue uh, with the guards and um, the criminal agencies about these matters, and we keep that under close review. Are you expecting that that will progress in the coming months? We certainly are in discussion with the guards about these matters. That's our regulatory obligation, something mm. we take very seriously. Mm. Um, you talked earlier about uh, people who are subjected to the enforcement powers um, and people who maybe just disappear out of the system or, you know, um, withdraw their applications. And all. How do we know who these people are? Or how are these people ever held to account? Well, can I say that, first of all, um, we can pursue, whether you're in the system or not, uh, the central bank and enforcement cases can pursue people who were involved in the management. In fact, that was a point that was fought about in the courts and the central bank's view was the one that was favoured, that we can pursue people in enforcement cases who were involved in businesses who no longer are. Mm. But in terms of fitness and probity, the power for fitness and probity is limited uh, to applying to people who want to work in the system or um, who are in the system, mm. and actually we're seeking a, an extension of that, but we keep a record uh, mm. of all of that, and um, we keep mm. flags and information, as, as is right that we do, about all of that. So if somebody wants to um, withdraw from a, an application, that of course they can do, but if they ever came back, we have a record of that information, and that would be ready uh, to uh, meet the challenge uh, on a successive uh, application. Okay. You see what it seems? It seems like that a lot of the individuals within the banking system have a lot of places to hide and then that the banks in themselves have a lot of places to hide because we don't get the information about individual banks. But I want to go on to the report um, just to, to, to talk a bit about I think that report and the culture is quite shocking, absolutely shocking. And I would ask you if you thought it was shocking yourselves because it's shocking to think that there are executives within the banking system who are paid hundreds of thousands, and there's banks making billions, and up to all of this, this is why it's con connected with the tracker mortgage, all of this um, reckless business behavior. And they don't even have clear lines. We're talking about clear lines of responsibility. You know, we're not talking about a, a, a creche or a NINA or a voluntary organization. We're talking about massive uh, organisations, and it really speaks of an absolute toxic culture where nobody knew who was doing what or who was responsible for anything. Um, it's bizarre. It is bizarre, you know, to read a report like this of the culture in it. And I do think that the language that's used within it does a disservice to the people who have been most impacted by the toxic behaviours and the lack of any type of management 
skills, even the most basic things of knowing who's responsible for what within an organisation. So you talk of, and I will, yeah, so thanks, Kahirlik. But you talk of insufficient attention to paid to consumer interests. You know, insufficient attention paid to consumer interests. The language in it is, is feeding into the culture of let's protect the institution. And I get it that the central bank, you know, don't, hasn't a direct line of responsibility for changing the culture within the banking system. But I would have liked to have seen much plainer language in this. In this report, uh, it almost smacks to me like, you know, when you're reading a, an academic book on change management and cultural behaviour within any organisation. Uh, and I want to ask you, how many customer interviews were conducted in doing this, um, this report? Okay, well, let me uh, uh, turn to Derville in a minute about uh, that particular aspect of it. I mean, I think we should focus on the substance here. Mm. Uh, you may have a different writing style to our writing style, but the bottom line is what we're saying is this is not acceptable. Yeah. We're saying that this uh, culture has to change, mm. and we're saying uh, through a combination of uh, supervisory interventions that we are making already and we will continue to make and enhance. Uh, we think it would be reinforced by the legislative change we, we're recommending. Uh, so we would agree that this is not, and it goes back to that uh, phrase, insufficient attention to consumer-focused culture. Mm -hmm. um, that is essentially, so in other words, uh, in, uh, uh, to, to some, uh, in some minds of some bankers, this was seen as a kind of, if you like, a kind of a secondary obligation, mm. as opposed to being at the heart of how they do business. So this is, I suppose, the, the shift, the cultural shift that has to change is uh, the our conduct mandate uh, and the expectations of, of the public are that they take their consumer protection obligations seriously, and that we all share. Uh, so I, you know, I don't really think the, the, you know, how we phrase it is, is the core of it. Is uh, it's it underlined by the actions we're taking, and as I say, that could be reinforced by this legislative change. Uh, in, in terms of how the customer perspective fed into the review, I'll so ask Derval. Might I say precisely because we completely agree with you that it was observable that the behaviour. Uh, that informed or informed by the mindset of the banks was very far away from that which all of us would expect. The culture reviews were undertaken. And the focus of the reviews then, because we saw the red flags in the tracker mortgage examination, the way that the compensation offers or, or negotiated with the central bank were absolutely not what we expected and that we had to do more than 200 turns of challenge to get those up to any kind of a level uh, at all was precisely conduct in the wrong place. The culture review was undertaken and it wasn't a focus on the views of customers in the public. Let me be clear because we had already had a view on what that was which was the very lightning rod for undertaking these five cultural investigations which were very detailed, forensic, careful pieces of work with behavioural psychologists, um, prudential supervisors, conduct supervisors who focused on the senior leadership team of the banks because they are so significant in delivering from the inside out the mindset and the value that the business places on customers and how they put them as they espouse to do so at the centres of their business and the divergence of that. So the language in this report represents an overview of the specific lender reports which each one got um, but it has very important significant findings and we are meeting the banks in, at the boards being very clear about our expectations but the culture is for them to drive and lead from tone from the top. So the focus definitely was on the senior executive team and how they will ensure that they are clear about what that culture, uh, that risk culture and that consumer focus culture looks like and how they will embed it into their structures and processes. Yeah. And precisely because we do take it seriously, we are going to be in at firm level supervision, 
measuring how they deliver that. Do they look at the complaints that people are making and find the patterns? How do they train their staff? Are they making sure that their staff are in fact trained to give outcomes that are to the benefit of the customer, not to sell 20 products to them that generate more profit? And do they check to see what they espouse as the culture for consumer centricity is in fact being lived? And we think the proof of the pudding will be in the work that they do. And this will take time because clearly their behaviour has not been in the yeah. right place. But see, I, I'm going to finish, I'll finish <coughs> on this one sentence. And that is, you see if this was a small or medium sized business operating in the reckless way that these banks have operated, it is not a behaviour psychologist that would be brought in. It would be the enforcement authorities and it would be a prison warden, not a behaviour psychologist. And that is the difference. We have no. enforcement investigations yes. open Thank in you. respect of all of the lenders. Thanks.